Let's kick it off. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 15th episode of Guts, Glory, and Story with Sangram and Alok. The last in the current season. Over these 15 episodes, we've had 10,000 registrations and over 3,500 unique viewers across these. And today, it is a befitting finale. As we present our guest for the day, Steve Winter, a man who's globally revered for his multiple award-winning big cat stories on National Geographic, and of course, his efforts towards their protection. But more of that very shortly. For those of you who are joining for the first time on our show, and I hope there are very few, I'm a Lok Sinha, donned several hats of CEO, investor, entrepreneur, and an author. My illustrious co-host, Sangram Survey, serial entrepreneur with two companies in advertising, a movie maker whose first movie cycle was screened in the Cannes Festival and has been extremely successful on Netflix. But before he gets Steve on stage, here is a quick lay of the evening. We have a set of questions for him, which will continue through the hour. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard me right, continue through the hour. Uh, instead of the first 30 minutes. But we will intersperse hand-picked questions that we have received from our audience, as well as those which are coming in live to us. Uh, but for the moment, ladies and gentlemen, it's all eyes on our power speaker of the evening, Steve Winter, and to bring him live on air, over to my co-host, co Sangram. Sangram. Thank you so much, Alok. And it gives me so much joy, Steve, to have you on the show. Uh, 2008, we met for the first time on the, on the Shkoda project. And I was very fortunate to attend the masterclass from the master back in 2008. Uh, and post that, I think uh, uh, we've been waiting for an opportunity to interact again. And I think it was during the Mumbai Leopards when Steve came to India and he was in touch with my friend Nayan that I got a chance to meet Steve again. And we've been planning ever since that we should be doing something. And well, the occasion is now. Steve is known for several firsts in the whole wildlife photography world. Uh, he was one of the first to uh, successfully deploy to the extent that he does remote control photography. I know Franz Landing and Nick Nicholson did that, but I think uh, Steve took that art to a completely different level. Uh, he's also known for something else. He's also known for introducing uh, the art of film lighting and wildlife photography. Imagine fashion lighting being done for wildlife that's what Steve brought, you know, glamorous, lovely looking pictures. Uh, and he combined that with the more photography. Steve has won the BBC Wildlife Photography Award several times. He's won the World Press more than once. And uh, more importantly, a lot of his efforts and his photographs have actually led to conservation efforts being taken to the next level. And we'll hear more about that uh, during the evening to come. Uh, Special thing, Steve loves India. Been to India several <laughs> times. Uh, we shall be covering a bit of that story also. Uh, so much to the way. extent Steve has actually learned how to cook Indian food. Uh, <laughs> such is the love that he has for our country. And we shall be ha having a bunch of questions on that. But I don't want to waste any further time. We're going to talk very much uh, today. It's going to be more of Steve and his pictures doing the magic for the entire evening. Uh, so, without wasting any further time, let me welcome one of the world's most renowned wildlife photographers, Steve Winter. Welcome, Steve. Well, thank you both, and it's great to be here to everyone. So, should I uh, go full screen now? You can go full screen, and I'll have my first question immediately uh, uh, post that. It's great to be here, everybody. It's kind of early where I'm at. But let's start yes. right off the bat yeah. with pictures. Now, um, I started working with big cats. And I'm going to tell you that story in a minute. But one of the things that I have tried to do throughout my career is to find images that I haven't seen before. Because our job as photographers, our job as photographers is to... Um, give people something they haven't seen before. So they look at an animal that they know very well and go, wow, this is a leopard here. 
in South Africa. It was lit with a little flash about the as big as my finger. So it just hits that leopardess who's in the tree waiting to jump down, but she's surrounded by hyenas and it took her 30 minutes to find a hole to jump down and then get away. But I don't, it, it would be great if we started with how a farm kid from Indiana came to India when he was 22 years old. And that's what I did. I came to India. I wanted to be a National Geographic photographer since I was eight years old. I remember looking at the magazine and wanting to walk down the village streets, meet the people that I saw in the magazine. So I went to college, didn't know what to do, quit decided to go around the world and my destination was India. Now, when I first got into Kolkata, I bought a third class India rail pass. Now, I don't think they have third class anymore, <laughs> but I went from one, from the top of the country down to the bottom to go to, over to Sri Lanka and then came all the way back up and took a bus from India to Istanbul. But to me, one of the favorite parts of the day was when I had that tray with all the little sections in it pass through the window or they brought to me because I fell in love with your food. I always say it was like a rainbow in my mouth. So, uh, you know, everywhere I went, I got something different. I'll never forget my first masala dosa given to me on a banana leaf outside somewhere in South India with uh, uh, everything that goes with it. And then came back to Seattle where I was living and learned uh, cooking from a food scientist from New Delhi. So that was great. So I spent about uh, six to eight months going around the world. Now, a lot of people ask me how I got involved with big cats. I always say that I knew nothing about big cats. Um, I barely passed uh, biology in high school and I didn't take a picture of an animal till I was 34 years old. I started out as a photojournalist with Black Star Photo Agency. My first picture was a marine turtle, luckily, because they move very slowly. So I was able to get this, though earlier I was very worried about it because I'd never photographed an animal before. They said, well, if you're lucky, you'll get a grandma turtle coming back to the ocean. And I thought about what I would do if there was a person there. Phil Flash, Dawn coming up, balance the light in the sky with the light on the turtle and boom, I got the picture. Though I didn't know it because it was back in film day, so I couldn't look at the back of the camera. I just had to hope that I did a good job. But then I got my first wildlife story, National Geographic, in the cloud forests of Guatemala on the resplendent Quetzal, where every day they were the sacred birds of the Maya and the Aztecs. But every day I would sit and hide in this cloud forest with my lens trained on the net. Some days I got one picture, some days I got two pictures, many days I got no pictures at all. But in the evening when I would start walking back up the trail to the one room shack in which I was staying, I'd get goosebumps and the hair on the back of my head would stand up and I'd turn around, oh, hi, tiger. I'd turn around like something was following me. I had no idea. And then one night I'm all alone in that one room shack, lying in my bunk, reading my book like I do every night when all of a sudden I heard the stairs creaking. Wow. Then the floorboard creaking. Then I heard scratching on the floor and then sniffing. All the hair on my whole body stood up. I grabbed my trusty machete, whacked it on the side of the bed, silence. 
And then for some unknown reason, I whistled. And I heard front paws, back paws going down the stairs. I grabbed the walkie talkie to call the naturalist I was working with, Juan Carlos. And in Spanish, I told him what had happened. He had the button pushed on the walkie talkie. I just heard a bunch of laughing and he said, Steve, don't worry. It's just a black panther. And I'm like, dude, I've been here five weeks and you didn't bother to tell me I was living with a Black Panther. And I figured then that that was the night that a big cat chose me because I always say I didn't choose big cats, a big cat chose me. That is a jaguar and a Black Panther is just a jaguar. Also, now, if anybody would have told me my next story would be on Jaguars, I would have told them you're crazy. I, I don't know anything about big cats. Like I said, I barely passed biology in high school. But I found out that National Geographic had never done a story on big cat, on Jaguars. So I started doing research on the story and my partner Sharon finally stopped me and said don't you figure in 107 years if Nat Geo has never done a story on the world's third largest cat there's probably a pretty good reason why and that reason is because it's very difficult but I found this uh, on the internet this is a Warner Glenn he owns a ranch in southern Arizona and he took the first picture of a jaguar in the United States. And that is the picture. It's six foot by nine foot. My assistant's in the back holding it to align it with the uh, horizon on the picture and the real horizon because it's the exact same place two years later. So um, uh, I started that jaguar story and knew I had to go down to Brazil because a scientist had emailed me because I was failing at what I was doing in the rainforest. So I went to the Pantanal and there I had to put that photojournalism hat back on because I found out that the Pantanal was 95% privately owned, mostly cattle ranches and all these cowboys thought the only good jaguar was a dead jaguar. And coming from farm country, I knew that was a ridiculous statement. So I was, uh, because there's no way that all cattle deaths could be attributed to a jaguar. And luckily the scientist I was working with, her boss was one of my best friends, the late Dr. Alan Rabinowitz. So I told Alan, I said, you should start a Jaguar project here with GPS sat collars. And then you could, we could give the uh, scientific data to the ranchers and they could change things. So he started the project. So these cats wouldn't end up like this Jaguar rug here or these 12 Jaguars killed in 12 months by one man, all supposed cattle killers. When the project got finished, they found out only 1% of cattle deaths could be attributed to jaguars. And that changed the way that ranchers and cowboys work because we're always looking for a positive result. Why work on a story if someone's just gonna kill all your subjects for a ridiculous reason that makes no sense. And I was also working with this man here who was the uh, Ranger of Pantanal National Park and the guy that taught me how to stick my head in a bucket and call a jaguar. Now it sounds like this. Now the first time I did it, I was all alone at dawn in the ranch truck standing up with a bucket. You know, I was very proud. 10 seconds later, a Jaguar called back. I got back in the ranch truck and went back to the ranch house because I didn't know what I'd do if the Jaguar actually came. Now, obviously today I do things differently, but on that, a, a couple of days later, I got the opener of the first Jaguar story in National Geographic history, this picture which was very important. But this is what's important. I went back 
And because of the three images that I had from the Pantanal in that first story, when I went back a decade later, I found out that most of the ranches in the area had turned into ecotourism lodges because they could make more money off of jaguar tourism and birders, the bird life, and the incredible diversity of the Pantanal, the world's largest inland wetland. So this to me was incredible because what was happening was that economically they were making more money. So not one person in this area would harm the head on a jaguar because they themselves or one of their family members was economically benefiting from living with the world's third largest cat. Before then, we didn't even know where you could see a jaguar. That, that's how I started the story. But now everyone, and I mean everyone, if you've ever been there, there's about 20 boats. It's like 20 gypsies around one tiger, 20 boats around a jaguar, which obviously is not ideal, but it's ideal for the jaguar because the, the Pantanal is now an oasis for jaguar protection. So that's how I got started, everybody. And I think we're going to go to India now. So, so Steve, is and, that the sequence? Uh, uh, the sequence was Guatemala first and then the Jaguars. And that is the time when you came to India. And this is the famous Steve Jobs request for some of the pictures. Right. Well, well, the Steve Jobs request came from that was a funny story because it was totally unexpected. It was in February, I'll never forget. And uh, I got a phone call and it said one infinity place or whatever, Cupertino. And I was like, well, that's Apple. <laughs> and uh, I picked up the phone and it was Steve Jobs' secretary. And it said, uh, if Steve Jobs likes your pictures, we'd like you to become an Apple consultant. So why don't you send them along and then we'll let you know in 30 days whether he likes them or not. I mean, it was something like that. I hung up the phone, turned to Sharon, and I went, I, this is what happened, but this will happen when pigs fly. And it was 28 days later, I got the call and he said, yes. Because I had started the snow leopard story, did a recce and had pictures of the Buddhist festival from Karsha. And Steve loved images of Buddhism and festivals from the Himalayan region. And so there was a, a picture that you're going to see coming up in Snow Leopards that he really loved. So, in the so that was a great opportunity that hopefully will come back because Apple's new iPhone now comes with the new Apple RAW file for the first time ever. Apple's coming back into photography. Wow. The, the uh, 12 Pro and the 12 Pro Plus, you can shoot raw. And it's an Apple raw, which is great. No more Lightroom or whatever. Wow, wow. So in the sequence, Steve, uh, after Guatemala, it was, it was Ladakh after Guatemala Strait? No, I spent 10 years doing many other things, but I just never came back to India. The idea of coming back to India was very exciting for me because it had been so long. And so you have a country that has this mythical part in my brain and my history as a young person because I spent so much time in your country. People told me to go to see tigers when I was there as a young person, but I had no money. I was going around the world as cheap as possible. So when uh, my editor sent an email to all of us in 99 saying, uh, what would your dream assignment be? And because I had read Peter Matheson's book, The Snow Leopard, I went, this could be an opportunity to get back to India. And so <clears throat> when she said, what would your dream assignment be? I thought, well, I just tried to do camera trapping on Jaguars. I didn't do a terrible job but let's do something no one's seen before. And I wrote, I'll do the snow leopard. Wow. And we came for a recce trip, but I hate the cold. 
<laughs> so I kept putting the trip off and coming back to India. But, uh, you know, the story was approved. Um, I decided to work in Hemis National Park because of the guidance of Toby Sinclair and Delhi and Raghu and Joanna. Uh, they really helped me out a lot. I couldn't have done it without out their assistance, but Toby said, go up to Hemis. And then he said, contact Raghu. And so I contact Raghu and Joanna and they said to go up there. And so I came back into India. Incredible story. Let's, uh, let's leave that I had all my permit, all my custom forms. And I went to the consulate the day I was leaving, you know, the India flights here from Newark leave at night. I got my paperwork, but he forgot to give me my customs form. And he calls me up, he says, if you have any problems, well, what he did first was said, you should wait a day. And I called the airline and said, how much is it gonna cost me to switch my flight? And they said, $2,000. And so uh, I decided to just go. 39 cases of equipment with no customs form. Can you imagine what was that like entering wow. customs at the Delhi airport? Uh, I had to eventually call the council uh, in New York. He got on the phone with the customs agent in Delhi. They got into a big argument over the phone. I didn't understand a word of it. And then the guy puts the phone down, picks up you the customs book from India. It's about this big, bigger than a phone book. Drops it on the table. He goes, why should we even have these laws if I'm not going to enforce them? And, but he let me in and then off I went up to uh, Hemis. But one of the big things that Sagram, you asked me to talk about is, you know, how I figured out how to do camera trapping. Yes. So I'll talk about that here. But when I got into Hemis, one of the first things I saw were snow leopard tracks. Wow. And then I met Rodney Jackson and his local team, the Snow Leopard Conservancy of India, they were working on camera trapping there. And this was during the recce. And when we got into camp, when we went in for the trip, the first day I said, we have to set up a camera trap. So we set up a camera trap, came back to camp, had some chai, and all of a sudden the cook starts screaming. And I said to Tashi, turned up the guy working with me. I said, Tashi, what's he saying? He said, there's a snow leopard on the ridge. On wow. the first day, wow, we had a snow leopard. There he is. Canada would give me that old 1200 millimeter. I put a doubler on it, which made it, you know, uh, 2400 millimeter. And off the cat goes walking on the first day. What and luck. so that day we saw a snow leopard. Two days later, we saw two more on the ridge because it was mating season. And then for the next six months, I never saw another <laughs> cat. But that's the magic of camera trapping. Now, when I started thinking about doing camera trapping of this, it had to be incredibly unique. You think about these wide vistas you're going to get of these landscapes, but how am I going to get the cat in my composition? It's using an infrared beam, and that is the only way. If you use a motion detector or something like that, you never know exactly what that first frame is going to be. But with snow leopards, even though you can see it's very open area here, they walk on a small trail. You may think that's ridiculous. They can walk wherever they want, but they walk on that trail because that's how they began their lives, following their mothers uh, on that trail. So they keep doing it. So it was really easy to know exactly where they were going to be. I would have someone come in from the left, come in from the right, so I could compose the picture in either direction. And uh, most of these pictures took about six months to get. But once the, they would break the beam, then they take the picture. And that first frame 
is a Steve Winter picture. I lit it the way I wanted it. It broke the beam in my composition. And that was how I was able to get these images. So I'd like to uh, uh, just tell the audience, uh, you know, the whole BBC story about uh, a human not being there behind the camera. So uh, after you complete, Steve, uh, we just like you to highlight that bit as well. You know, the criteria for BBC and how this whole thing about it being your frame ultimately qualified and got you the maximum awards. But yeah, I can kind of... Yeah, you, you need to talk about that because that's important. But looking back at this picture, this is what I was trying to get. And you'll see the picture. So you put this up, Tashi comes in, and th this is this whole problem with doing camera trapping. You have to have so much patience and faith that eventually Tashi is going to turn into a snow leopard because every day the only thing you see on the back of the camera is him or nothing. You may have a bird walk through the frame. It takes one picture, but then it takes 10 more. So you're looking through it, hoping that it eventually is going to have a snow leopard in the frame. And we were super lucky here. And it wasn't just the first day we got it. On that first trap, three days later, we got our first picture. But like I said, we had the help of Raghu and Joanna. And uh, we set up camp for the rest of the team. We had, you know, cooks, guide, Tashi. I think there was about four or five other people. And so you go to the cook tent at night because it got down to 40 to 50 minus below zero. And so that was cold. So you sit in the cook tent at night, nice and warm. I had a case of old monk rum and everybody watched videos at night. Well, I would go to bed because I was exhausted. This was the hardest physical thing I've ever done. I don't have the lungs for the Himalayas, but it was great having their help. And this was the first image that we got. Ooh. Literally, he, there you go. And so what so you it shows how as long the tail is. Sorry, Steve, call as the Steve Winter photograph. Is that the photo which is straight looking into the eyes of the cat? Is that what you call as the Steve Winter photo? No, because in the end, when you're doing a trail shot, you very infrequently, especially in this situation, would have a forward facing cat because that's a 50% trap. You're either gonna get the front end or the back end of a cat. And when you're doing something no one's ever done before, you don't want the back end of a cat. You want it to look at you. Why they look at the camera is a complete mystery. On my Sumatran tiger picture, it's looking at the camera at 1.30 in, in the morning in the complete darkness the trail goes this way, but the cat's looking off to its right, right into the camera. And I have no idea whether he sees wow. a reflection on the front of the glass of the box. <laughs> uh, Intuition. Uh, there's something oh, you. how about now? Is it better? Yeah. yeah. Can you see me now? Yes, Steve, we can. Okay. You're frozen. For Hello? Me. Yeah, you're frozen, oh, Steve. Uh, I think Steve is frozen. We're all in lockdown here. I don't use the Could be problem. If there is a problem, I'll take a break and switch. Okay, he's trying to switch. I think he's switching. How's that? Uh, your picture frame is frozen, Steve. The slide, uh, show, slide show is still frozen, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think to let the viewers know that last one and a half days, there's been massive storm. And Steve did mention that, it, that the weather has been really bad. Very, very heavy storm. And uh, that's the reason why the connection has been very poor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's back, I guess. Yeah, he's back. I hope I'm back. 
You're right. You are. <laughs> we can hear you. I think we'll just have a get on the Am side. I? Yeah. You are, you are. We can hear you. We can hear you. We can oh, who see. knows what happened. Okay. Um. Sorry, everybody. Let's get back to what we were doing. Yeah. The magical photos are yet to oh. come on the first one. Can you see that? No. Light show is not up yet. No. All right. Share screen. Share computer sound. Sorry, everyone. No, you don't worry. You just don't worry. Yeah, it's happening. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There we are. Now yeah. it's here. All yeah. right. Yes. We'll, we'll start going a little bit faster. How are we doing on time? Uh, yeah, we've got about 25, 30 minutes. Uh, we can overshoot right. by about yeah. yeah. Yeah, so here's another image that I got, which to me was very important. But part of it was the physical aspect of it and the cold. Going up to set a new camera and finding all of a sudden you get up there after a five and a half hour walk and a snowstorm comes in, you know, and the, my assistant Tashi said to come back. And I said, it took me five and a half hours to walk up here. So uh, you can come back tomorrow, but I'm not. <laughs> Luckily, it we got a bunny, but eventually we got this image. Wow. So Ooh. these are the kind of things that when you do these stories, take a huge weight off your shoulders when you get these kind of images. It wasn't perfect because with the cold and freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing every day, uh, the trigger moved a little bit and we missed his eye. But this is the picture that Apple bought and you can use it as your screensaver. And we always need landscapes in this dramatic area. We're looking down on Rumbach down there uh, between the V there. Getting the prey animal is super important. And to see these series and the fact that we're getting the cats during the day. When BBC first started this, they never got any pictures of the animals during the day. So you can see the cat rubbing and then it goes back to see if it smells like him. Because these are marking territories, you know, this is an area where the male leaves his scent to tell other males, this is my territory, not yours. And this is is an image that I always say that we need to talk about the fact that the Buddhism is the glue that holds this area together, their culture and their religion. And the fact that local people need to benefit from living with predators. And so small NGOs coming up here and working, um, many of the local herders hated snow leopards because they would lose a lot of their um, livestock to them, the cats. And so starting a program where they benefit from living with these cats is vitally important. And whether they put predator-proof corrals in, and all you need is about $75, the equivalent to buy this chain link fence. They have plenty of rocks or a project that they had mentioned and then I had met with the rangeland uh, guy from uh, USAID that gave me a bunch of vaccines. So I hired this vet on the right and um, started a vaccination program because I found out that most of these villages were losing 30% of their animals to disease. So you start a program under Snow Leopard Conservancy India and where you give them free vaccine as long as they promise not to kill snow leopards. So you're taking an economic negative, turning it into an economic positive, which is really, really important. 
It's like putting 30% more money back in their pockets, save snow leopards and help the communities at the same time. And now they love snow leopards. So that's a huge positive. You can see the longest tail of any cat in the world. The opener of the story, and this is where Tashi did turn into a snow leopard. Yes. It only took him six months to do it. <laughs> and that's the thing about a lot of these cameras. They only had one frame. That uh, Is it the same spot, same direction, the way you had pictured, the way you had framed? Is it the same spot where Tashi was and this is the same spot where the snow leopard is? Yes. Yeah, I, I moved a lot of cameras, but there were certain spots like this was chosen by Raghu. And the reason Raghu chose it, he was walking up to look at the spot. We're down a little below catching our breath. And I see Raghu running. How do you run at four and a half thousand meters up the hill? He's running and we're like, what's he running for? Is something chasing? There's nothing chasing him. What's he see? We found out he saw oh, snow leopard come right up this trail. <clears throat> so in this instance, I would have never moved this camera because we knew the cat used it. So it was there for the whole six months and we eventually got the opener of the story and eventually then got this image. Wow. Um, which was the uh, one that won BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year. But you can take over in a, in a minute, Sangram, but I just want to tell everybody that I didn't enter this contest. Sharon entered this contest. I was out of the country and she decided that I should start entering contests. So she did it. I, I hadn't done it because I figured I already won. I want to be a National Geographic photographer since I was eight years old. But then I found out that when you enter contests and you win, these contests travel, the shows travel all over the world and literally millions of people see your work. I mean, the world press show travels to maybe 40 locations. I'm not sure how many with uh, Na uh, BBC Natural Natural History Museum, but it's hundreds of thousands of people. Then they see your images and learn more about the story and the situation, the species you're working on. So I think uh, I'm just going to interject with one question uh, because I think we have a lot of uh, uh, questions which came also on our emails. And even right now, I think in our panels, there are a lot of young photographers uh, who have a similar dream. They want to become a National Geographic photographer and shoot pictures like these. One of the questions is, what does it actually take to become a National Geographic photographer? You have to be a visual storyteller. You have to have a story of something. And the, the old uh, story I constantly use is about Bob Gilka a, the director of photography that I never knew. He was before my time, but he told a story to one of the staffers. He said, find me a photographer that's done a great story 10 miles from where they live and I'll give them a job. That was a staff job then as a National Ge Geographic staff photographer, because many young photographers think that they have to go halfway around the world or have one incredible picture of an animal or a great animal portrait. National Geographic doesn't run animal portraits, number one. You have to become a visual storyteller and doing something close to home means you can spend the time needed to do a great story, to be able to spend time with your subject and eventually get so close to that subject, whatever it is, that the emotion comes through your images to the viewer because you're showing your images to people at Nat Geo, the director of photography, and they have seen it all. So you need to show them something they've never seen before. And instead of them flipping through the iPad like this, they go once and they stop. Wow. Then you know you've won, but be a visual storyteller on stills and video and tell them something and make them feel you know, all, all art is about emotion. 
and you have to make them feel something. And you may, you know, most people go, well, I don't have anything around where I live to shoot. That's not true. You know, even the people closest to us have incredible stories, but we may not know them. Your grandmother, grandfather, the person that has a little shop down the street, all these kind of things can be stories or the animal that you want to cover, but you need to tell the whole story, not just try to get pretty pictures. So that's my long answer to a short question. Brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. And I think that breaks a, that breaks a misconception that uh, trying to become a National Geographic photographer is all about going out in the camera in the wild and clicking pictures. So for all of those people, I think Steve has given a brilliant answer. And with that, I think we move further with the slideshow because we have many more images to cover. And this is uh, Alok, the Mumbai leopard story that we've been yeah, discussing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the most fascinating one. <laughs> it's scary and fascinating. Go ahead, Steve. Steve, you know, I have my son sitting right next to me because he wants to ask a question. So I've told him, you're well, out there. The 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 there he yeah, is. Have him. <laughs> there you he, Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? He's your fan, uh, Steve. Well, thank you very much. Uh, re remember, we always have to be humble. And the fact is that I do realize how, what, how lucky I am that I'm doing this. Life has changed so dramatically during lockdown. I can no longer travel. And so you spend over 20 years doing a certain thing and then it stops like that. So we have to be blessed for our health and the knowledge that we can get back out in the field. But it's great. If you have any questions, Come along and ask me right now before we go into Mumbai Leopards. You want to ask Okay, you? so I have one question. I read in many articles that you've played a very pivotal role in wildlife conservation. And I've read in one article about the tigers in captivity. What was the most difficult part of winning that case? I think that answer will well. Come. It is coming up in the that answer. Exactly. The answer will come. And we have a great thing that just happened you, in, in our uh, Congress, because mostly nothing happens in our Congress. But two days ago, something great did. So it's a great question. It's going to have a, a more detailed answer in a minute. But if we go to number one, let me shut this here off. Oh, good. I'm dying. Um, the Mumbai leopard story could not have happened without the Hollywood cougar. Um, many people know that image of mine. This show is going to end on it. But uh, Sunita when I decided... has asked, uh, so Sunita Ramasamy, who is uh, who is a regular on our show, and she teaches, has asked about the Hollywood cougar. I had half a, uh, you know, hard to type out, but I said, no, I don't want to destroy what you're going to show. So, so please go ahead. Right. No, don't worry. We're going to see it in the end, but it was the whole idea, especially in LA about, and then when I heard about these leopards in Mumbai, I was like, I have to go. But being in LA to see how the knowledge of living with wildlife energized a whole metropolis. I mean, it was amazing. You know, I thought people would be scared, number one. But uh, I'll tell the story more then. But when I became successful there and saw how people were excited about living with wildlife, the LA school district brought it into their plan. The Mayor Garcetti made a P-22 day for the cat that lives under the Hollywood sign in Griffith Park. And it showed the power of photography. Because I only got two pictures. One of them happens to be killer. <laughs> and it took me 15 months to get. But I heard about these cats and then saw some BBC footage. And it was shot with a thermal camera and an infrared camera. And to me, it almost reminded me of a dream sequence in a movie that somebody's having a dream, la di da, and there's this weird thing going by, or a horror movie, I guess you could say, even though we don't watch horror. 
their life is scary enough as it is without adding to it in my opinion but uh so i said you we need to photograph these leopards and then film them in white light because the average person's not going to believe that they exist unless it looks like where they live so you have a relationship to that apartment block there could be my apartment block no matter where it is around the world except for the fact that it has a leopard walking in front of it and not a and a wild leopard so i proposed a story on leopards you know you can't propose a story if it's been done at least a decade you know before so it'd been a while since we did leopards. We started in South Africa and then moved to India. I was going to go to areas to cover wild leopards in uh, Kabini and other areas and the black leopard. But then the leopards of Mumbai grabbed a hold of me and uh, creatively, I wanted to get the picture. So had a great team of people. I know Nyan's out there. I couldn't have done it without him. And uh, tried to figure out locations. And that's what you do first. Where am I gonna set these cameras? Where do people see these cats? And we're like the, the Hollywood Cougar, the first question I asked the scientists that put the GPS collars on all those cats in the largest urban park in the United States kind of mirrors Sanjay Gandhi National Park because they're both in large metropolis. Where to put the cameras? Where do people see them? So this is an area near a, a holy site where pilgrims come and this man that oversees the holy site has some goats and, and, there, and he has water for them. And he says, oh, at night I look out my window and the leopard comes to drink water when during the dry season. And I go, perfect spot for a camera. And this, obviously, this is not what we first got. This is just to get your attention. But this is one of the best pictures I got through it. For all the photographers out there, when you're setting a camera trap up, all the other camera traps I've done, I know exactly where the animal is going to break the beat. This, like a kill, is a circular area, so the cat could come in from any direction. Luckily, it looked back. I look just like you said, why is the cat looking at the camera? It's facing the opposite direction, but even turns around to look at the camera, luckily for all of us, because it's an incredible shot, and it's at dawn, where all the other images, for the year this camera was up, we're all at night. So I was really lucky. But what I wanted to pick was to find a spot where I could show humans walking during the day and the cat walking at night. So we found an area that had two bridges and where I called them small bridge, bridge, bridge and big bridge. So this was the small bridge where you would get a tight shot of just the bridge uh, area on top and then the lights of the apartment block. And so set up a camera here, get people walking by. As you can tell, these people aren't even taking notice of the fact that flashes just went off and they got their picture taken. He's on his phone, she's looking at the end of the day, it's dusk and people are getting ready to leave because it's getting dark. This is after midnight, probably two or three o'clock in the morning. Wow, it says- uh, Same face? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Sangram, that's Mumbai. Can you see this? And then uh, tell me, do you see this picture of all the people and the light? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, good. Because it said my internet was unstable again. So, but we also had to cover the fact that in the poor areas, some people have had problems with the leopard coming in because they don't have facilities. They go into the woods and um, some people have gotten killed. So there was a little girl who had been killed here. And it's very difficult to get these pictures. This is at midnight in an area where the government had come in and just put a spotlight to try to scare away the animal. I don't think that worked. I think the people needed to lose latrines so they wouldn't have to go into the woods. And uh, when they squat down, they look like food. When we're standing up, the leopard won't touch us because we're, we haven't been a part of their food source for millennia. And he had, this a picture ran in National Geographic. This mother lost her daughter and uh, the, her, the present child was born on the same day, has the same birthday as the child she lost to the leopard. Another woman here in RA, which I get, I, I hear something great has happened. So why doesn't somebody tell that story about RA? What has happened to RA? Milk colony. Yeah, so uh, Steve, on the RA question, I think there's good news. And I, I would I would give that uh, credit to two people. I think it started off with you, because uh, the discovery of leopards, all these stories about uh, people getting killed by leopards, uh, is pretty much in the past. In the in the more recent future, I think leopards have learned to coexist, and I think it was first discovered by your cameras, uh, where we showed that people are walking on the same path every day without knowing that leopards in just two hours are going to walk on the same path. I think your cameras revealed that. Nayan picked it up. Nayan is there in the audience. Uh, Nayan picked it up. He continued the story. And, uh, you know, that created massive awareness in Bombay that lepers have learned to coexist with humans. And right. some of these pictures reached the government. Uh, and our current environment minister, Aditya Thakre, he saw pictures of the Luna, whom both of you all have shot. And uh, he asked, where is this happening? And uh, when he discovered that uh, this is actually happening in a part that uh, uh, got encroached upon and which was originally part of the forest, he said, uh, I don't need any further proof. Uh, some of the world's best photographers have shot with camera traps over months. There is no further need of evidence. And that's how we ended up declaring 200 acres as uh, a protected area. And that area was reclaimed, is currently being reclaimed back as uh, leopard territory. So a big thanks to you, a big thanks to Nayan for all those pictures that have actually uh, reversed what is usually considered impossible. Is, is the picture of the grandpa on screen now? Yes. Yeah, it is. It is a shocking picture, but you need to tell what is behind that curtain. <laughs> What's behind this? Uh, all right, we come into RA and uh, I can't remember who got out, the guys that were helping me, but there was an older man there, he was drinking. Uh, he drank a lot. And they asked him a question about whether he'd ever seen a leopard and he said, started walking over to these stairs and says he sleeps out here because it's cooler. And his daughter-in-law doesn't like him drinking, so he likes sleeping outside because then he doesn't get bothered about uh, drinking. And he showed these stairs. I couldn't understand him. And it was translated that the one night the leopard came up and was put his nose right on this uh, screen right here. And so I put a camera up that was there probably a year and I got three images of a leopard coming in. I wanted the one coming right to the uh, man sleeping under the mosquito net there, but it's an incredible image to see that the cat comes. The only reason it would come up to him is because he says he takes his goats in and out here. So the leopard's smelling food, livestock, uh, because they have plenty of food in Sanjay Gandhi in the center of the park. 
there's a huge herd of sambar spotted deer there where most of these leopards will feed during the day or night and then come over and investigate. So I thought that this was an incredible shot and uh, I was so happy that we finally got it. We would ask local people like here, we came down from that one holy site and uh, this is about midnight. And I said, could you ask them if they ever see a leopard? And they said, oh yeah, we see leopards here. And I said, can you ask him where? And he said, well, they come out of the park entrance and then go look for stray dogs or some animal to eat. So we st I stayed up all night long for about three or four nights and then said, forget it. We're never going to see anything. Just leave it to the remote cameras. And so here's a picture of a leopard with, you can see all of Mumbai in the distance. Wow. And on the same trail is, is a, a man walking up to the holy site. Uh, there was a whole group of people. There's another man on the right. I think he was actually walking down when the flash came, uh, went off, he turned around. And then there's the cubs coming up. So humans, animals use the same trail. Yeah. And then you can see the cubs there drinking. Yeah. There's great video of this that you, if you haven't seen it, watch the leopards at the door. Cause there's a sequence here and there's a wedding going off in the distance and you see the fireworks going off in the video with a leopard drinking out of the water there. So that's incredible. In the area where the bridge was, um, I, I asked them if they'd build a, a platform. They said, sure, we'll build a bamboo platform. And that's Bertie Gregory, who I hired when he was 20. Now he's just an amazing, amazing filmmaker, though he was from the beginning, but he's done all the latest Planet Earth, Seven Wonders. And I think he's maybe 25 or 26 years old now. And uh, so there we are. And I built a platform so I could be at the same level as the top of that big bridge. Because what I wanted was a wide shot. Most everybody wants a tight shot of an animal. You know, like this, the leopard coming right with the bridge there in the background mm -hmm. in the car park. But, and this is the picture that ran. So this is like eight, 20 at night you can see the window on the lower right there's actually people looking out the window because when my lights would go off or during the video when the lights came on and stayed on people would run to the windows to look and that was part of what we filmed i asked who lives in that apartment there and one of the boys was playing cricket and i said he said, I do. And we went up to interview his family about what they thought about living with leopards. So watch that show if you get a chance. But my favorite picture from the whole thing besides the dawn breaking with the female leopard drinking and this one is this image right here. Because this says it. Ooh, my you talk about living with leopards. Look at all the apartment blocks all lit up and then this cat walking by. So that's photographically, we, we have to shy, get away from always having these tight pictures of these animals to show the cat in its habitat. And this is a habitat you wouldn't expect, you know, it's like showing the mountain lion with the Hollywood sign. But these cats walk on this bridge every night, but it's not lit like this. There's, I think, seven lights on this, one on the ground lighting the circular under part of the bridge also. But this was my idea. It's a half second exposure. You can see that's why the tree is blowing there. So it's pretty incredible. So this is- Now a on to another story. So yeah. We just need to let the viewers know that we are running about 20 minutes late, 20, 20. So yeah. they should just- Continue, yeah, go ahead. All right, so I'm gonna rush through this one because there's a couple things after it that are vitally important. Sharon and I did a short story for National Geographic on four paws 
uh, save, and what Four Paws does is they save animals primarily from war zones or, or areas of uh, natural disaster, like animals that would be in a zoo in this instance, the largest safari park in the Middle East because of the Syrian war was totally bombed. Hundreds of animals were killed and Four Paws went in and saved the last 13 animals. Two lions, two tigers, two bears, two hyenas, and a couple other animals. And we got them out and got them. You can see she has shrapnel wounds on her back end. And uh, they took her from Aleppo. The safari park was outside of Aleppo. And it took a month to get from Aleppo to Istanbul. We met them there and to the princess of Jordan's. Uh, animal rehabilitation facility. Um, and there was constant problems. They were ready to put it on a Royal Jordanian cargo plane, but they were a day late getting to Istanbul. So we were gonna put it on a passenger plane, but the cages wouldn't fit. There's a bear inside the cage. They have to grind the wheels off because it won't fit into the cargo hold of a passenger plane. So all these problems, we flew to Oman and then got in the, the, this place, the uh, rehab facilities on top of a mountain where she has many animals that were primarily part of the pet trade. But here's the tiger going in. And this was the saddest animal taking a month being bombs going off around them. And I, I had tears going down my face photographing this tiger here that had been in one of the worst situations that humans could ever put an animal in, which was a war situation. And then not having any type of stability at all, living in a cage for 30 days and finally getting to a point there's a, a, one of the lions getting to the point where it's, air, it's moved by crane and open to a big enclosure with trees and grass. And, and uh, so the first thing the tiger did was went straight into the swimming pool that they had made for it. But the things that we as humans do to these animals for our own benefit, as Bitu always says, leave the, me alone or leave them alone for tigers. So it's a great story, but we want to run through it. It's a great organization. They just, they're, they're getting ready to retire about 3,000 elephants in Myanmar or Burma. So the organization does great work. Now, we want to go to something that Sharon and I did that it started on the last National Geographic Tiger Story. When I did the Tiger Story, I wanted to cover subspecies that had never been covered before, like the Indo-Chinese tiger, the Sumatran tiger. So I went to Thailand to work with the Thai tiger team. This organization, a uh, group of people, is one of the most exciting group of scientists I've ever been around. The master's students, PhD students, and undergrads all work together monitoring the tiger population in the Western Forest Complex, which is in Hoi Kai King National Park, about four hours west of Bangkok. The king used to love to go there because he loved photography, the king that has passed. Um, he always had a pictures of him with his Canon camera around him. But Alan Rabinowitz started this project about leopards that then went into tigers and they have been camera trapping so they know which cats that they have. For almost 30 years they've been doing this and started a project to get the home, uh, home range study of female tigers. It had never been done before. GPS sat college study they really wanted to know if these cats go outside when they're dispersing outside the protected area into the rice paddies, what happens. And they have a great program of anti-poaching, just like India does here. But this is the Smart Patrol Rangers. These guys are armed. They're trained by the Army and the police. And 
since uh, in the last eight years, they've had no poaching at all in this area because they've had firefights with poachers. There was one problem when I was there where they put the poachers poisoned a carcass and killed a female and her two cubs and the main male of the whole area. And there hasn't been any poaching since. So this works. Having got men on men and women on the ground patrolling the area. But all right, let me not get to that yet. All right, I'd heard about this place called the Thai Tiger Temple. And it was a tourism operation. They had a bunch of tigers and hundreds if not thousands of people came through the gate every day. I talked to the Thai Tiger team and asked the scientists, I said, hey, I should go to this place. And they said, Steve, don't go, don't go. It's a terrible place. We think it's involved in the black market trade in tigers to Laos or China. And I said, well, that's a good reason for me to go. If none of you guys won't touch this because it's a sacred place. It's a Buddhist temple that has a tourism operation. You know, they breed tigers because 365 days a year, you can pet or bottle feed a tiger cub. Yeah. And they always have 160 tigers. That is impossible. If you're going to breed tigers so you can pet cubs, what are you going to have? A lot more than 160 tigers because the death rate's not going to match the birth rate. Yeah. So something fishy is going on. So I went there, got a picture, saw the cub petting, the bottle feeding, and got the picture that ended up in National Geographic. And I never forgot about it. But when I got home, I told Sharon about it. About a year later, she was contacted by a single woman that had an NGO in Australia that had started her master's work here because she thought, well, I can be around tigers. I can do some research with them. Found out that they had been, um, found out some fishy things and started talking to a couple of the people there that were very devout Buddhist and wanted to leave. And so she told Sharon that she could give her information if she could sell a story. So Nat Geo said, sure, go. And we need video. So I went along and did the video. And so we went back spent four days there. I'll never forget the first day we went in as tourists and I was filming. And then the next time we went in, I called up ahead of time and said, hi, I'm Steve Winter from National Geographic. And they all said, oh, we remember you when you were here for the tiger story. And they said, thank you so much for coming back to save us. And you just don't say a word about what you're doing. You don't lie, but you don't say a word. We came back. I did a video that Nat Geo then put at seven and a half minutes, put it on the web. Sharon wrote a story. The evening news in Bangkok, all the news services pulled the video off the Nat Geo site, used Sharon's article, pulled my pictures off the Nat Geo Instagram, ran them in all the, in the Bangkok Post and uh, other news sites. Sharon wrote four stories, never gave up, gave the government enough information. There's the Bangkok Post story, used all her information. And on the fourth story, the government had enough information. They went in, confiscated 176 tigers and closed the tiger temple forever. They found 30 cubs in jars, 20 tigers hanging from meat hooks in the freezer. It's like this is not advocacy journalism, but it's journalism with a tangible result. Result. We'll give you the information you need, government, to make a decision to close this place down. Don't just say we think they're involved. Find out. Because the wildlife of the world and our planet doesn't have enough time for us to wait to find out. We know already. We have to be proactive and get out there and work. 
And then I got a picture of an Indo-Chinese tiger and there were, were none of those. Wow. And then, you know, we had never done the, the Thai tiger was the first time I'd ever photographed or filmed cats in a cage. And that kind of got us on the track of wildlife trafficking in a more concentrated way. And throughout my time at National Geographic, after being Nick Nichols' assistant back in the 80s, I mean, sometime in the mid or late 90s, Nick had said something to me about the fact that there were more tigers in Texas than there were in the United States. And so I had heard this, and it wasn't until afterwards that Sharon went to a meeting of colleges had tigers as mascots and it had people there talking about the problem of captive tigers in the united states the fact that there are more tigers in the united states in roadside zoos and entertainment facilities than there are in the wild in india wow. and the rest of the area but the vast majority of our world's tigers are there so we proposed the story Sharon was accepted as the writer. And then I had to fight to be the photographer because going back to doing something different, I started out as a photojournalist and this is coming back to it. These are three tigers that were, that came from Joe Exotics in Winniewood, Oklahoma, and came to the wild animal sanctuary north of Denver. And here they live their life out. They'll never be touched again they will have great vet care and they'll live in this big area for life it's the largest sanctuary in the world um so and this, these are some of the things i got two days ago the house of representatives and the u.s congress passed the big cat public safety act this will ban handling of cubs if you can't have cubs then there's no economic incentive for this whole thing to work. But the other angle on this, the reason the bill was passed with Republican support was the problems with first responders. When these areas, many are in the South, they could have 200 cats in a roadside zoo in an area where there's hurricanes and tornadoes. What happens if the fence falls down and these cats that have never known anything but a cage go out? This is Disaster City at Texas A&M University. This is where first responders come to train. They have an oil refinery that's constantly on fire. How do you put that out? All these other things. So I bought this tiger here in the background on Amazon. It's a child's toy stuffed animal and put it in the back of this car to help illustrate. If a tiger was walking around during a storm, where would it go? In an enclosed place where it felt safe because it doesn't know the wild. It only knows what humans have done to it, which puts it in a cage, a little night house made out of cardboard to go in at night, not cardboard, uh, plywood, and it would do that but we worked with some really shady people. You may have seen him in on Tiger King. If you saw it, that's Doc Antle on the right and his family there at one of their tiger shows. There's private owners throughout the United States that have tigers um, in their homes. Went to county fairs where they have tiger shows. And the only way that you have cubs is to breed these animals. Doc Antle is the number one breeder in the United States. And then these small tiger shows that you didn't even know existed anymore, you know, that because the Ringling Brothers Circus is closed down. Um, and so there's tigers. Uh, the only way that they can get these um, get people to come in is now through social media because they don't advertise because the Humane Society and PETA would get on them. And so I, as they would organize these photos for Instagram, I would there be taking pictures. And I wasn't supposed to photograph 
until the picture was totally set. But this chaos shot I said was like me testing the softbox, see if the light was okay. And this picture ran as a double page in the magazine. Doc Antle hated this picture, which means that I won. And that means Captive Tigers won. If he hates it, that's good. Just because look at these cats, Brad. One quick question that you, you've also got threats uh, from some of these people. Yeah. I don't know. You've got life threats from a lot of people, right? Oh, yeah. We got done with one interview after being in a place for a couple of days. And the person said, if this isn't a positive story, I'm going to send a bomb to your house. <laughs> and this was not said as a joke. And as soon as the pictures went up, I got all these comments on Twitter and Instagram that were really bad. I started seeing my computer act strange, so I use VPN and try to use a lot of antiviral stuff because I'm still posting. I didn't post about the Big Cat Public Safety Act next yet, but after this, I'm going to. So if y'all watch my Instagram, you're going to see some more of these pictures pop up and talk about the fact that the law was passed. But these cubs, listen, everybody. When I was at Doc Antle's, when we were doing that chaos picture here, I looked over to a guy who had an a iPad. And he had five security cameras on the iPad. And I said, what are you doing? He goes, we have five females getting ready to give birth. And so as soon as they do, we have to go in and pull the cubs. And you can't say anything because they invited me in. Mm. But these cubs are taken away from their mother at birth. They're not fed properly. At docks, it's different because things have to be five star, if you can think of it that way. The place is very clean. It's like going to a really clean uh, zoo. But most of these places, you know, you saw in Tiger King where Joe Exotic pulled one of the cubs out with a metal hook uh, just after it was born. They f suffer from melodotic bone disease, all these uh, different problems. And they're there to be used for three months until they're too big to pet. And what happens to them after that? So, and all these places, even the Tiger Temple, have the word conservation right when you walk in. So many people think that they're helping tigers in India. Trust me, this is crazy, but they think they're helping tigers in the wild because that's what they're told their entrance fee is going to. And we, when I photograph this picture right here, we had to have everybody sign a model release or the pictures couldn't run in National Geographic. So we figured out Doc Antle on this first show, one show of a two show day, conservatively made $50,000 in three hours. Wow, wow. This is big money. That's huge money, yeah. None of these guys are gonna stop because it's the right thing to do. No, they're gonna keep breeding and breeding and breeding because there's so much money involved. And what happens when the tigers grow up, when they become adult tigers? I mean, I visited 32 states and Sharon's the most in intrepid investigator. We know that they're either discarded, killed, or given to sanctuaries. But the given to sanctuaries part is the very small part. It's getting bigger and bigger now. That's why the opening picture of the wild animal sanctuary that was started by a guy named Pat Craig when he was 17 years old. It's now the largest sanctuary in the world. He just got 9,500 acres in Southern Colorado where these, the cats and bears can roam. Because this also a problem with bear cubs. And so the, a bunch of sanctuaries are buying more land knowing that something is going to happen and these animals will be retired and will live the best kind of life they could live. When they were making the bear sanctuary, it was one of the most beautiful areas on top of a mesa 
overlooking an incredible western scene, 100 acres they had. The first two tigers were in a 35-acre habitat with trees and stuff. So breeding is constant, so they can constantly have cubs for uh, operation in Myrtle Beach that costs, costs $100 a picture for you to hold the tiger and get your picture taken with it. So you talk about lines down the block during the summertime. It's an amazing amount of money. And this yeah. night show they had at night, this is a five inch piece of window where you shove a foot long hot dog or sausage to the tiger. Have you ever seen anything more demeaning to the most iconic majestic cat? And you all know it. Here's Eric Cowie who worked for Doc Antle, now Jeff Lowe in their operation. And you see what happens to these inbred uh, hybrids and the sores that they have, the medical problems. The University of Tennessee Vet Center is trying to help this cat who's had an allergic reaction. This came from Joe Exotics. They just wanted to get rid of these, uh, the two brothers. The other brother could barely walk because he had metabolic bone disease being taken away from his mother. So this was a horrific story, but it's a story that had to be told. And Sharon did an incredible job she, they couldn't edit her story, so they gave us 30 pages. Now, that is the kind of story that you want. And it has done so much to influence the government and get the Big Cat Public Safety Act. And she's writing another story right now in the other room for National Geographic on what's going on now with this. Now, this is Pat Craig. You know, he started when he was 17. He's now... Uh, in his 50s. Wow. And this is part of that Southern Colorado area where two tigers that came from Joe Exotics now have 35 acres to roam, hills. And it's just incredible to see how they are now instead of being by, behind chain link fence in a small area. This guy, Jim Garrison, was in the Tiger King. He had these tigers that eventually he went broke so he asked Turpentine Creek Wildlife Sanctuary to take them. Here's the people at Turpentine Creek. There's a vet. She started out as a volunteer, then went to veterinary school. There's Scott in the back. He and his wife run and own it. Emily's head of keeper. He used this plastic shovel to put by the head in case the cat wakes up. But they get vet care. Incredibly large facilities. And here's a cat that came from a bad place, a pet uh, cub uh, petting facility, and now they live in a great, great sanctuary for the rest of their life. There's still people doing magic shows using tigers. And so I was able to get pictures because of this. He's got a great show. He doesn't need tigers. He bought these cubs from Doc Antle, of course. And now, Here's a great story to end it. It would cost $40 to get a USDA permit to own a tiger in the United States. In many states, it costs, it, it is more difficult to get a shelter cat or dog than it is to get a permit for a tiger. Wow. And one reason that you, you would say, why doesn't US Fish and Wildlife do something? They are now because the law was changed. The law was, it doesn't fall under the Endangered Species Act because these are mutt tigers. They're mixes. They're not purebred. So you, you're not saying this is a Bengal tiger. It's a mix of a bunch of different tigers. Could even have lion blood in it because they all want to see a liger because of Napoleon Dynamite and other things. So the law was changed to include generic tigers, which means that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife undercover agents went after Joe Exotic when they saw on a Facebook site that he had shot four, five tigers in the head and buried them on a property. The undercover guys went, took a backhoe, dug up the tigers, prosecuted Joe, and he's spending 22 years in prison now. And as of last week, his partner that took over 
has a 110 page indictment against wow. him, Jeff. So everybody would say that these places were full after Tiger King, that there's no such thing as bad press. Guess what? There is. You open your dirty work and you're very honest that the government isn't going to touch you. Well, guess what? The government's decided what you're doing is wrong because it's illegal. And now they're coming after you. So that's great. Oh, we were going to show this. Now, this was a tough story to do working with these people, but I'm not sure if this will. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. Hi. Is the tiger attacking you? Oh, my God. Yep. Oh my That's God. the only place it hurt. My left kidney hurt after that. Wow. He just wanted to play with these 280 pound Thai Liger. I mean, Thai, Thai gun. So it's wow. tiger lion mix, tiger mother. And I got away. I didn't even know my son was filming. I just came back to that him. woman that was trying to help me was on the cell phone and never got off the cell phone the whole time. I've always wanted to ask her, what was more important than saving me on your phone? You know, why'd you, and I, to this day, I've never asked you that question. Who was she talking had to? A lot, of, a lot of hairy events there. And with that, I will leave you here. Sunita Ramaswamy, that is the picture that you wanted, the Hollywood Cougar. The Hollywood Cougar. That's the one. Yeah. And this was the picture that created, ended up creating one of the world's first wildlife underpasses. That's right, Chief? Right, yeah. Well, what uh, th this got such an enthusiasm from the people of LA that they're now building the largest wildlife overpass in the world for all the animals to go across, specifically for cougars to come from the north side to the south side because they're now genetically inbred, but P-22 is still alive, still living in Griffith Park. And it just shows the power of photography that you can save the area and the species that live within because of a picture. I mean, it's a pretty incredible picture. Um, I must admit that took me 15 months to get. So it was saving, getting 200 acres of land, uh, you know, thanks to photographers like you in Mumbai, getting the world's largest wildlife overpass, shutting down uh, the domestication trade in Thai temples, uh, having a law against domestication of tiger trade in America. That's the power of photography, guys. And that's the job that Steve and so many people are risking their lives doing it for lovely people in the wild. Steve, thank you so much. I think with that, we come to the end of the show. And it was a visual treat. It was a very different show from whatever we've done so far, where we just have question and answers. And here, I think uh, we've just been seeing amazing pictures. And not just that, we've been hearing uh, about how photography has made a huge difference to conservation. So, Thank you know, this, the story of hope continues. So, so Guts Glory story was about story of hope. Uh, and this continues. Well, you know, we, we each can make a difference. And we all know that right now we need to, everybody get together to um, help save our planet. Yeah. You know, big cats have a huge importance because their homes are vitally important to us as humans. But we all need to understand that the health of humans, animals, ecosystem, nature uh, are inextricably linked. So we need to watch the health of all of them, especially now during COVID. It's so apparent that our destruction of the forest and using endangered species and putting them together creates this Petri dish of uh, what now is zoonotic diseases jumping from animals to humans and humans to animals. And people need to realize that one of the biggest problems with lions is that humans give them TB. So 
love, respect for the nature, which is total perfection. And there is hope if we all work together and never give up. Let's save big cats, save our planet, save our ocean. Thank you all for coming. And thanks for having me. Y'all have a good night now, okay? Yes. And Thank you. I think with that, Alok, uh, should we call it a day? Yeah, that's right. I'm moving my 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 camera back to me. Uh, this was okay. this was the last part, the last uh, the last session of the season. And uh, to our viewers, thank you very much for giving one hour every Saturday for the past many weeks. And both Sangram and I, we've enjoyed being with you, hosting a lineup of some of the best in front of you. And we will be back again in January with a different series and a different lineup. Uh, thank you and over to you, Sangram. And thank you, Steve, once again, a phenomenal finale for, for, for Guts Glory and Story. Absolutely. We're going to miss our Saturdays. Thank you very much for having me. Starting from 3 o'clock in the afternoon, doing our rehearsals, uh, exchanging ideas about how to structure sessions, and 6 o'clock, the mandatory 6 or 7 session. We're going to miss that, but not for more than two months, because we're going to be back in two months with more inspiring stories. A big heartfelt thank you, Steve, that we finally connected and we brought you on the show. And... Uh, uh, we would love to extend the invitation to India. I would love to host you again. Alok and we would love to host you again. Nayan would love to connect with you again. So whenever COVID allows us, uh, please come back to good. the rainbow of flavors to the country that you so much love. And on that note... Uh, <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I will be back hopefully uh, in the 1st of May. We First talked day. about it a couple of days ago with and, uh, Oh, yeah. wow. Super, <laughs> super, super. So I'm going to mark it in the calendar and uh, we will definitely catch up. I'm going to take you up on that, right? Absolutely. So, thank you, very very much much for having me. Thank thank you. you again. Yeah. Absolutely. Everyone. Bye. 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 Goodbye. From Bye, -bye. All of us. Bye, Bye. Goodbye from all of us uh, to all. Well, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Bye to all my friends out there in India. <laughs> See ya. Okay. Okay. Bye. Take care all. Bye-bye.